Hi, I'm Chris Martins, and I'm, I've worked as a senior reviewer both for the Absolute Sound magazine and Hi-Fi Plus, but for this show, I'm representing Next Screen Networks. And with me is Wendell Diller of Magnapan, and the occasion here is that Wendell is using this show as a chance to introduce his new LRS Plus loudspeaker. Mm -hmm. But first, I thought I'd ask you, Wendell, some questions, kind of with, with viewers. Questions? No, no tricks. Okay. Uh, kind of with viewers who aren't very familiar with Magnapan at all in mind. So can you give me sort of a thumbnail, quick history of the company? 50 years? I was supposed to distill that down into, you, you should have prepped me on this. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, when, when was the company founded? 1969, June of 69. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's a long time. I started uh, marketing magnaplaners at Audio Research when, you know, Jim Whiney and Bill Johnson had a five-year agreement. And uh, so uh, we were responsible for marketing the Timpani series back in those days. So okay. I always liked loudspeakers, mechanical things, uh, more than electronics. And so when that five-year contract ended, then I went to work uh, for Magnapan. Excellent. And it's, it's been fun. I, I mean, it's Jim Whiney's invention is so simple and elegant. Um, as an in inventor, uh, you know, you know some of the other toys that I've invented, uh, non-audio related. I, I mean, I have the utmost respect for something that's so simple that accomplishes so much. Yes. And it's made it fun. In fact, I'm having so much fun that. You know, I'm 78, uh, been doing this since well, 1973, and it's, it's something I want to keep doing because I enjoy it. Excellent. But I, I find it hard to distill it down. It's, it's all about the, the primary thing is this is an incredible invention to that can reproduce sound in a, such a cost-effective way. And what can you do with this technology? That's... There's always another frontier. I hear you. So just looking back over time, what would you say are the, the iconic Magnapan loudspeakers? Well, okay, in the audio research day, it was the Timpani 1D. That, was, that hit the sweet spot. That was extremely successful. Uh, Wow, there's so many models after that. I mean, candidly, the uh, the owner of Next Screen and the Absolute Sound and Hi-Fi Plus, whose name is Tom Martin, uh, Tom Martin and I went to a stereo store in Chicago called Victor's and oh, yeah. heard yes. the Timpani 1D. Yes. And you know, it, I remember at the time we both kind of looked at each other and kind of went, whoa. I didn't know well, a speaker Victor, could do that. It wasn't that great of a sound room, if I recall correctly. No, but the Magnapan made the most of what was there, I think. Yeah. So, so that was your... The, Jonathan Vallon talks about his, um, his experience in Chicago when he, he was fooled more than any, probably any other time in his life thinking he, that was a piano. Uh, and then he walked into the room and it was a speaker. Yeah, well, the, he saw these panels, but he, he, he saw the piano and he heard the sound, and he, if I got the story straight, and he concluded that it was the piano he was listening to. Something <laughs> like that. But, yeah, it, that, what, those, those first experiences are unique. But uh, It was that kind of speaker. Yeah, there's been a lot of... Over the decades, there's been a lot of high points. I've, I've had a hard time. I would need more time to think about. The Tiffany 1D was obviously iconic. The MG3 series were a very successful uh, product category. Then we had the Tiffany 4 and the Tiffany 4A. That was uh, that was an amazing product, but it was so big. You know, that's when we had to come out with something 
that was smaller, and that was the MG20 series. So I can't remember exactly, but when did the models that have the, the decimal points in their names, when did those start coming along? I can't remember dates and times. I, I have to remember it by wedding anniversary and the dates of my kids, but that's, that's about it. Okay. But they, they, for, for people who are new to the brand, a lot of the models are, well, they start with the numbering 0.7 and 1.7. Well, that was Jim, Jim Wine, was, you know, being an engineer, that's, that's natural. To, he would give them decimal points. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So at this stage, the, the premier flagship model is the 30.7? Correct. And that brings us around to the opposite end of the price spectrum, the, uh, the LRS Plus. Uh, talk about that. What, what, what is it? What's it meant to do? Well, my, my thoughts are I don't view this as so much as a product, as a new tool to deal with the problem. We live in the Amazon world now where everything, click and ship. Um, given the, the, the change, the 1970s aren't coming back again. You know, we had stereo stores, multiple stereo stores in small markets. And now, you know, it, the change began to take place in the 1990s as the dealers financially, they had to diversify into custom and home theater. I mean, their love was two channel, but they had a business to run. As they diversified, the two channel part of the market became less important. And that was a slow process that I was watching and so I'm worrying about, well, where this is going? When will it ever come back? Well, then the pandemic come, came along and I had a lot of guys my age or you younger that gave up, retired, hung it up. It's not coming back. So what is the guy, the customer in Billings, Montana, that owns an expensive pair of box speakers. He's heard about magnifiers, he reads the absolute sound, but he's not going to buy, if he's not going to buy the high-end, our high-end models based on what Jonathan Valen says or any other reviewer, he's got to hear it. Yeah. This the LRS is the tool that I envision that Okay, I'm not in sales anymore. I'm just thinking marketing strategy. I love marketing strategy. I'm thinking, all right, we, you're that customer in, in Billings, Montana, and I want you to consider the 20.7 or maybe the 30.7 or whatever. So I'll make a deal with you. I'll send you this pair of LRS and we're, well, let's get on Zoom and I'm gonna help you set it up. And I'm gonna see, so you don't really, well, I want you to have some skin in the game, but I believe you're a potential customer for a 20.7 or a 3.7. So I've done this with Zoom with the, with the 30.7s in Australia, China, United States. You get on, I look at their room and I've set up enough magnaplaners. I can tell them where I think they should be set up. I watch them react. They give me the feedback in real time. I make suggestions. I can tell whether it's clicking with it, whether the customer. So I noticed that you, to cut this hypothetical customer, were really, I see by your body language that that vocal, wow, that, that's better than that. I see the look on your face like, ah, Chris thinks that the, the mid range of this little speaker sounds better than his box speaker. Okay, now we can talk. But you, you, because your room was big, 
you notice, well, it doesn't have the base, like my, um, my $15,000 box speakers or whatever. Okay, I got another tool in my toolbox. And that is this, the, the key is this flagship, con this prototype concept that you've heard that we've shown a few times. Now we have a new avenue that, all right, you want to fix the base issue with the little LRS? Uh, I've got something to work with. And we, we negotiate. The, the dealer could be doing this function because he's got a lot of customers that live too far away. He can't get them, to entice them to come in and hear his store. Or maybe his store is, he's had to downsize and he really doesn't have that great a sound room. This, I call this the virtual dealer in-home demo concept. Okay. I think it could work. And, and the whole purpose of the LRS Plus was giving a higher level of resolution that could challenge some very expensive box speakers in certain parts of the range to make it a, a tool for the new method of marketing. Okay. Now, we you, haven't really got that started, but it's, it's a concept that I, I believe has potential. Well, you know, I think one thing that's true, and viewers may be interested in this, is that th there have always been entry-level Magnapans, at yeah. least as I remember. My memory goes back to the, the 70s as well. But, um, but the trick was the entry-level models were sort of a compromise because the early oh, ones yeah. were designed yes. so that you could use kind of cheap electronics with them. But then when you brought out the original LRS, which stands mm -hmm. for Little Ribbon Speaker, yeah. um, that was kind of a watershed moment because all of a sudden... No, it was a big gamble. <laughs> it was. It was a lot of risk because Jim's strategy, Jim Winey's strategy was to get... The, he knew that the customer wouldn't have a high-end high amplifier and they were expensive, good class AB amplifier back in those days. So he needed to design it to run it with, and for NAD was a big deal, an NAD receiver with an SMG or SMGA, that was a hot combination. But it, it's, a, it's a Volkswagen, um, and we knew it. So I mean, the MMG was the beginning, in 1995, was the beginning of our 60-day home trial concept. Well, as we were seeing our dealer network changing, evolving so dramatically. So that was a factory direct or a, turn, or a dealer method of getting people started. But so the, it was successful since 1995, never was changed. Well, we did the MGI, which was some, uh, smoothed out some of the, the lower treble in the tweeter, but the LRS was a big gamble because you needed a serious amplifier. And I was kind of nervous about this. Uh, what if we need to have, the customers need to have a, a, a modestly priced amplifier available that will drive this load uh, because it, it's the same kind of load as our more expensive models. That was the, that was the big gamble. Well, you know, having reviewed the original LRS for, for Hi-Fi Plus magazine, I mean, one thing I can speak to was that compared to all the entry-level MagnaPans before it, the LRS was the one where you would sit down and listen to it. And if you were familiar with the, the bigger, more expensive MagnaPans, you had to kind of stop and go, this is a lot like the bigger models. Yeah, that's correct. And so well, the, what, what about the amplifier problem? Did you put it on some amps that it just didn't cut it? Uh, no, but then again, the amp I have and used with it is one I, you hmm. know, expensive enough. I don't think most people in a million years would buy that amp. Right. But uh, 
Although they'd be happy if they did. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so I take it the idea behind the LRS Plus is to turn things up an even bigger notch from the original LRS to have an entry-level model that's even more like the expensive ones. No. No? And for, for the entry-level customer, I don't know if they're going to appreciate the difference. If you had moderately priced electronics, I don't know if they would detect the difference between the LRS and the LRS Plus. Uh, it, it was not done for that because for that intention because we were running what like five months back ordered or something. You don't come out with a new model when you can't produce the models you have. Oh, well, this was all about. In my mind, it was thinking, what are we going to do? How can we reach that high end customer? Yeah. So just give them the resolution. Uh, the. the come up with an idea how we can give more resolution and that the customer with high-end electronics could appreciate. That was the whole motivation. It was like we needed a boost. In the, you know, the customary thing is after, what, five or six years, you come up with a new model. You tweak this or that. Well, we don't do that, for one, because if you can't, if it won't pass a blind test, we don't come out with a new model. Um, that makes it difficult. So it was strictly delivering higher resolution with the intent of reaching that high-end customer. I don't think it's going to make any difference uh, between, you know, for the person that's just getting started. In, in, unless they have good enough electronics and source components, correct? Uh, again, if, the, if, if the, the LRS will do the job, it's it's done, but it's been amazingly successful at reaching that entry level customer. So another level of uh, resolution, you know, if it's, it's kind of building the lily a little bit. I guess so. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you could say it that way. So what what is well? Let's let's start with the value side of things. What is the price difference between the LRS and the LRS Plus? It, it you we're hit with inflation, so it's uh, it's a mad scramble. I mean, the prices keep going up. The magnets, the perforated, everything is going up. So it's you have to put it in real dollars to say how much more is it, how much better sound for in real dollars. Well, I, I don't know how we do that calculation. Fair but enough. We're, we're still getting slammed with price increases. I mean, this inflation thing is, well... It's real. <laughs> everyone's kind of nervous about it. Are we going to get this under control? Yeah. So, what, well, let me, let me come at this a different way. What is the price of the LRS Plus? Nine ninety five. Okay. okay, so it's not a huge jump up from the LRS. It's just it's a little more expensive, but and it may not be depending on how you do figure the inflation. It's not really that much of a price increase. <laughs> it may not be I'm, any. <laughs> I'm, I'm worried about. I mean, how we've got to get this inflation under control because we don't we can't just keep eating the price increases. At some point, you've got to pass it on. Yeah. Now, um, with the, the LRS Plus, um, wh what are the primary differences between it and the LRS? And I realize you can't go into well, yeah. a lot of the technical ones because... You remember how Harry Pearson and Jonathan Vallon beat me up on the, on the, the 1.7? I, it, it's like, look, I've, I've been through this so many times. It's like, the, the man, Jim Whitey's invention is so simple. It's the, the, there's nothing that's that, that impressive. It's not impressive to me. The, the, the incremental increase improvements, um, it's, there's no diamond-crusted or beryllium dome <laughs> or, or exotic cabinet. It's, no, no, no special monk sauce. Yeah. 
It's not that exciting. It sounds better. Do you really need to know? Well, some of it is, you know, it's a secret sauce. I mean, we're not going to give all of our, give up all of our secrets, but it's really not that impressive. It just works. Okay. So visually, the LRS Plus is what, an inch narrower yeah. than the, the original LRS? Right. It's the same height, yeah. has the same base response. Yeah. New stands. Yeah, that's an option. You know, but the that but that it's been a, a little cottage industry for some time making stands. It's like, yeah, we should do that, we should do that. So okay, finally we got a stand. And how much are the stands? Uh Two eighty, two eighty nine, I believe. Okay. Well, they're Just going to look pretty beefy. So sonically, what can somebody who already knows what the LRS is like expect from the LRS Plus? Higher resolution, top to bottom. Okay. No sales hype. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no special weird technologies. <laughs> Just. Go listen to it. Yeah. See what you think, and but we're not expecting people to step up from the LRS to LRS Plus. And for as I said, for the entry level customer, I don't know new. I'm dating myself. New improved Tide soap. I never. I don't know because I never had the old Tide soap. <laughs> so okay, I hear you. Yeah. Um, what? I mean, here in this setting. We have the prototype of MagnaPan's dipole or subwoofer, just so people dipole can kind Dipole woofer, yeah. By the way, we're, we're calling it ultra-wideband uh, base system, UBS. Because right. I, you know, I did that demonstration, what I'm doing uh, on the road. By the way, this, I, I see this as a pivotal technology for MagnaPan uh, because it's... Uh, I believe it's patentable, um, but we're looking at that, that that's being investigated. But it is, most consumers are not aware of the difference, what is a dipole versus, versus a monopole woofer, subwoofers or subwoofers. So one of the things that we're doing as Galen and I are touring North America is Letting them, but we, but over 50 years, we've been saying, no, 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 you don't want to put a, a subwoofer with a magnaplane. It doesn't work. Well, technically, it doesn't work uh, because you're mixing a monopole with a, with a dipole. This is a dipole, so it works in the same, it produces sound waves in the same way that the big panels do. So the demonstration I did for you was to, okay, let's play it full range. You don't need, some, a woofer doesn't have to produce high frequencies and produce cymbals and violins. Let's do it anyway. The point is that I've seen it so many times in the chat rooms. Oh, you don't want to use the XYZ subwoofer with a magnifier. It's just too slow. But this is ultra wide band response. Uh, and so we're doing this demo unrealistic demonstration to say it can produce symbols, violins, it can reproduce. I've inadvertently, <laughs> at the show here, I got fouled up on the demonstration and I, I'm playing what I thought was the LRS and wait a minute, oh, oh my God. Well, I'm playing the, I'm playing the, the, the woofers. Whoa. So it's, 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 of course, it doesn't have the resolution of the LRS in, in the highs, but it was a long, it took me a little bit before I realized my mistake. I well, mean, and we saw that with, um, with the gentleman who was listening alongside me earlier, because he walked in in the middle of us right. listening to the woofer, and at one point I leaned over to him and I said, you know, are you ready for this? You're just hearing the MagnaPan woofer. The MagnaPans aren't even turned on. Yeah. And he kind of looked at me like, yeah, you're crazy. You know, they have to be playing. And in, in fact, he later asked, so that was the woofer with the MagnaPans, yeah. right? Yeah. And you're like, no, yeah. <laughs> no MagnaPans were harmed in the making of this demo. That's 
just the woofer. And his eyes grew about the size of silver dollars, you know, and he was yeah. like, really? That's just the woofer? And it's like, no, yep. I, I find that when I do that demonstration, some people don't intuitively get it. That, that, uh, that me if it can reproduce the highs, that means whatever, t whatever it shares, since it produces the same, what, the sound waves in the same way the big panel, if it's got that kind of bandwidth, then obviously it can, whatever it's sharing the load in the mid bass, it's going to stay in step. Yeah. And that, that, to me, that's intuitive, but not, not to everyone. So we explain it that way, that it has no problem keeping up. Well, and, you know, it, it's really true because I find a lot of audiophiles hear the reviewer speak of, oh, this woofer's not that fast. Yeah. And, but they're but they're kind of in a place where like well what does a fast woofer even sound like I don't know what you're talking about right and and yet you know when you hear a slow woofer with a magna pan you know the the effect is that you know well now I have bass but it's not really synced up with the speaker yeah and there's there's a couple there's a number of of technical reasons that this is going on it's not just speed. A transient characteristic. It's also the, the the monopole versus the dipole wave propagation. There's a number of things that goes on. So in this demonstration, you're hearing a woofer slash subwoofer that's got imaging. It can reproduce an orchestra. Uh, it's got sound stage. You don't need that from a woofer. But, but it's nice to have. <laughs> if you get down to really nitty gritty, yes, it should propagate the bass. In the, in, in the same way. So wherever it, wherever it shares the load with, with the panels, uh, there's no problem integrating, with, by, which, by the way, frees up from a design standpoint. Ah, now what can we, can we make something that will fit in our little townhouse? Because all these years, decades, I've never had, we live in a, we love our townhouse. We've got a wood stove. There's no place on one side. The left channel, forget it. So now we can, we can, I've brought home prototypes, very narrow. Now you've got something that we can put the woofer wherever it fits. You know, it's a narrow column. It could drop it in between the furniture. It's going to screw up time, phase, amplitude. Fix that with a DSP. Um, so... One thing that you've mentioned, and it occurred to me, you know, viewers for this video would perhaps be interested to know, is the flagship 30.7 MagnaPan is a large speaker. If we had it in the room, it would yeah. go more or less from that wall. Almost that wall it wall. off. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. 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 And yeah. while it's a great speaker, it's, it's a speaker that probably needs a big room. Right. Mm -hmm. And one thing um, that... You, you've helped develop with the, the MagnaPan team is the 30.7 for condos, which is, you know, a pair of narrower planar magnetic right. speakers with a set of those woofers. Correct. And yeah. that's what we want in our townhouse because we can. We can, you know, I can have most anything I want, but I, that's, I got 1.7s at home. And yeah, it's a great speaker, but I could listen to the big models at the factory, and eh, yeah, you know, who, who wouldn't one. want them at home if you could? Exactly. So th yeah, the the thirty point seven C. I, what that implies is we're we're not settled on that na name or designation, but it's got the performance like a thirty point seven. Condos implies that it will work in a small room, and yeah, it's going to be expensive. It's going to be the flagship. So that is the. I mean, this is. I see this this woofer, this dipole woofer, as the proverbial fork in the road for Magnapan because it open. It gives you so many more design options in what you can do with with the panels, because they can now share the load. And it, as you heard, it can keep up with any of the panels. So the woofers we have right here, 
at this event are really the same. That's basically the woofer from the 30.7 yeah. for condos. Yeah. Um, but as I recall, you said the design can be scaled downward at least to a point. Well, yeah, yes. It's, you know, this, this concept is unique. And we'll start, we're starting to work on going down market, less expensive models for augmenting the, the existing panels that are in a room where they, they, want to, they need a subwoofer and we can demonstrate. Mm -hmm. You can have your, your continuity where you can't detect the woofer and it just, it just fills it out in, in a, a room where, that is hostile to dipoles. So maybe this is a good point to take a bit of a break and then we'll come back after word from our network sponsor. Okay, very good. So, Wendell, you've mentioned that this new woofer concept is sort of a fork in the road. What does it imply for future MagnaPan models? Well, to, um, I've always felt that the, the Jim Winey's invention has so much potential, but when you're asking this concept of a ribbon or quasi-ribbon or planar speaker to produce all the frequencies, there's, you got engineering constraints. Namely, you want to sound better, they get bigger. Now they're too big, I can't, you know, I can afford them, but I can't use them. So this is a critical, it frees you up into, if you can imagine it, um, you've got a system, you've got the lower frequencies covered with something that will blend with whatever you want. I mean, hypothetically, you want an on-wall speaker and you have a shoebox-shaped room, uh, you put the panels on the wall, you, they're motorized, they come out. Now you've, you've got something, you've got woofers that whatever limitation that on-wall model might have, you've got a woofer that, no problem, we can play nicely with each other, and you could have a, a magnapan sound and something that you look around the room and you don't see any, any loudspeakers. I mean, I, I, I don't know that, I failed to mention that this concept, because of, this really works because of DSP. I mean, a dipole woofer is not a new idea, but with DSP and the, the power you can get with Class D amplifiers, you can position it in many different places you couldn't otherwise put it, and you, fix, you can fix the time phase amplitude problems with the DSP so it plays nicely with whatever the panel might be. So it, it really just opens up a lot more, frees up your design thinking and what type of ribbon speaker you want to produce. So now you, you don't necessarily have to have that great big membrane in order to have high quality bass. Correct. You can do yeah. it with... That's correct. And it'll blend with whatever design you want to come up with. Excellent. Well, I think that that's very exciting. And, and you know, we, we envision... We're going to be going uh, lower-priced dipole woofers. Um, this is also a learning process for us because it's a unique approach. Uh, and yeah, the existing your existing magnaplaner model. You want better bass. You want good integration. We eventually will have lower-priced options. So this is the flagship. It's, uh, it's pretty impressive. Well, in fact, we'll, we'll have to do a little more listening here, but yes. it, uh, it's very impressive. So um, one question I wanted to ask 
for you to phrase in layman's, layman's terms is, and I get this question all the time whenever people see the MagnaPan 3.7Is that I have mm -hmm. in my reference system, and they look at the thing, and you know, you go through the routine of what is that? Well, it's a loudspeaker. Mm -hmm. Get out of here! No, it's a loudspeaker. Would you like to hear it? And then after they hear it, the very first next question is, how do these things work? So how do MagnaPans work? Well, they work the same way that a conventional loudspeaker works. If you, if you took a conventional, I think the easiest way for somebody to comprehend it, let's take a conventional cone speaker and convert it into a quasi-ribbon uh, magnifier. So if you take the magnet, the magnet structure, cut it into thin strips, and put it on a perforated steel plate, which acts as the magnetic pole piece. Then you would take the, the, the cone and flatten it or, or turn it into a sheet that is a half a mil thick, very, very thin film, and stretch it over this diced up magnet structure. Now, then you take the, the voice coil winding and you flatten that wire into a foil and you attach it to this flattened cone, which is now a film, and put it on the film, in this foil on the film in a serpentine manner. You've now converted it, a, a wolf, a dynamic speaker, into a quasi ribbon. The different, we call it quasi ribbon because true ribbon only had the foil between the magnets. So anything that deviates where it's on a substrate, where the foil is on a substrate, we call it quasi ribbon. Okay, all right. So it, it's, it's the same principles. But it's just. It's executed differently so that as a film, because it's pushed over its entire area, it doesn't have to be stiff. Where a cone has to be stiff because it's pushed from the, 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 the movement comes from the coil in the middle. So it has to be ideally extremely stiff so there's, it moves with the coil. But when you make it stiff, then you increase the mass. Well, if you make it into a film and push it over a total area, you can have very low mass because you're pushing it over the entire area. But, you know... And That's this is why uh, MagnaPan sounds so fast and agile and Yeah, the, the, the unit area of mass is extremely low if you measure it in terms of square inches. It's, so it's got transient characteristic because you've, your, your mass versus your area is, is very, very low. So let me just follow up on something. When you have MagnaPans with a highlight lamp, shining on them. Is, are the silver strips we see, is that, that's the foil? Correct, yeah. Okay. Yeah, very simple. Well, al although as I recall from a visit to MagnaPan where I attempted to build one once, it, it takes really delicate hands to uh, do it yes, right. Yes, it's, it's labor intensive. Yes, yeah. it's more, you know, cone speakers uh, dominate the market because they, they've got obvious advantages. Yeah, I mean, you can churn off a whole tray full of drivers almost in an automated process. And MagnaPens, as you say, they really are hand-built. Yeah, that's correct. Yep. I mean, you can automate parts of it, but not the critical stuff. Yeah. Okay, well... I'm thinking this might be a good time to do some more listening. Is that sound yeah, like a plan to you? Yes. Okay. I'd like you to hear that, uh, the rest of the guys to hear that bag of playing, that, that woofer concept playing wide band, reproducing an orchestra or uh, dr the drums are very impressive. Oh, yeah. Yep. yep. Let's okay. do it. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much okay. for your time. I really appreciate Thanks it. Thanks a lot. Thank you.